Hey, Haley, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, man, uh, I'm doing great. And uh, I'm honored to have you on my show. It's it's really cool to, to talk to a, um, you know, I still call you a professional athlete. You know, you just you just retired and, and transitioned out of the sport, but you're still staying in the sport. But it's just an honor to talk to you about your whole journey and your mindset and all the things you had to do to train your mind. And then also we're going to talk about the importance of transitioning out of sport today and uh, and what you're doing for the youth right now, for young female football players. So hence the, the, the organization that you are a part of called Female Footballers. So we're going to be talking about that towards the end of the show. Yeah. Awesome. So let's get into it. Let's set the tone of the show. It's uh, mindset, mental toughness. And I know you've been mentally tough throughout your whole career. Um, when you think about mental toughness, what, what does that mean to you? I think a big thing of mental toughness is perseverance through times where you're struggling. So we know that as athletes um, at any level, our confidence is going to waver at all times. There were points in my college career and professional career and mostly my youth career is kind of where it started. But there are times where you're just not feeling 100% mentally, um, whether that's with um, the competition you're dealing with, your teammates, um, just physically not feeling at your best. And so I think it's in those moments being able to kind of turn a switch on that helps you still perform at your highest level, even if your mind is kind of telling you it's not totally there. Right. Absolutely. And this is a two part question with mental toughness. So because you have this long history of, of playing the sport of soccer. Um, and you said that in your youth, this is when you started to develop this mental toughness. So when was it, can you go back to the time where like, we're like, oh, this is like where mental toughness started or when you realize the awareness around it. So there's that piece of the question. And the other is share a moment at any part of your career where that monumental moment where you had to be mentally tough, dig in your heels, go through some uncomfortable stuff and be mentally tough. So I think I first started recognizing this stuff around probably 13, 14 years old. And it mainly came about um, in recognizing a lack of consistency on the field. And um, at a young age, I think most um, players who go on to play collegiately or professionally, um, they definitely show an aptitude from a young age and kind of um, show those moments of greatness at a young a young age and I had that, but it wasn't consistent every game. And I knew that that was something going on in my brain, not necessarily with my body. So that was kind of when I first noticed it. Um, and pointing to a specific moment where I needed to be mentally tough. And it, at least for me, the mental toughness was kind of having that sharp edge and being able to kind of stay at that level. So for me, it's not always um, mental toughness of like, oh, this is so difficult but it's more a mental toughness of like, okay, you have to operate at this high level and do your job at a high capacity all the time. And that is much tougher for me than kind of a difficult physical moment. Um, so it required kind of that precision at a young age, because especially you could feel it in, in now it's changing, but 13, 14 years old, I was being recruited by colleges. So the consistency needed to be there. I mean, there were at least maybe eighth grade was when I started getting um, phone calls to my club coach about from big D1 programs. And so that consistency mattered in that we would have games where a hundred college coaches were sitting on the sideline and you needed to be kind of on at any time because you never knew who was watching. Wow. So that was kind of, I guess, the pressure element too probably played into that consistency. Um, so I'm, in terms of the specific moment where I had to be mentally tough, um, I think it kind of was those big matches where there were all those college coaches on the sidelines. And then in my own time, putting in the work, um, I worked with a sports psychologist when I was in um, early high school um, to kind of work on those skills. So it was manifested in the those big games. But I remember the mental toughness being that work I did when I wasn't on the field. So it seemed like in your in your youth, you had a lot of mental training, mental opportunities. How did that prepare you for when you played? Cause I'm going to go back. Cause there's some really good stuff mm -hmm. there. Um, but I kind of want to jump a little bit to your, your D one experience at, at Cal um, and also your professional experience. But it seemed like 
you had a lot of exposure to the inside out game, how to deal with all mm-hmm. these different pressures. How did that help you when you went to Berkeley and played your professional career? I think it made me more cognizant that those were going to be issues that were heightened even further. Um, I know we'll dive deeper into this, but even at the collegiate level, it went to another level of consistency that you needed to have because now my technical and physical skills were being tested at a much greater level than they ever had been. Um, And you're competing against people where it's now it's a business, unlike youth sports, where you're giving players time and making sure everyone gets that exposure. When you get to the college level, the coach needs to keep his job at the end of the day, and that's by winning games. And if you're not there to support that effort or be ready at that time, uh, that transition was definitely difficult um, when you weren't starting every single game and kind of when you'd always had been. So it was knowing that I would have to rely on those tools and use them. And I worked on that stuff, had to work on that stuff even more in college, but it was definitely still a difficult transition. And I imagine if I hadn't been aware of those issues related to the mental side, it would have probably been devastating at the next level. Mm. Let's go back to when you were, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, Mm -hmm. you have, you know, I know a lot on the club level, there's a lot, you know, even when you're playing high school as well, but the club level is where you get a lot of exposure and yes. a lot of the colleges, scouts, recruiters, um, this is real right now. And I, it's been real for a long time, but there's, I'm dealing with as a mental performance coach, a lot of young athletes that are trying to get those recruiters and scouts, their attention, or they've already got their attention. They've already got the scholarship and they got a couple of years left to play, but it's a distraction because they want to make sure that they're still going to uphold their, their value. So this, so this is, I know there's a lot of athletes going to be listening to this that will want to hear from you. How did you deal with those pressures, the expectations? And was there something that you found out along the way that worked for you to manage all that noise, potential noise? Right. I definitely think that the situation is more intense now than it was, geez, 10, 12 years ago when I was going through the recruiting process, especially like the parental pressure, the club pressure, all of that stuff that I adds a lot um, onto an athlete and kind of dealing yeah. with that. Um, I was lucky to have very supportive parents who my mom was someone who kind of helped me recognize these mental skill sort of um, issues that I might be dealing with related to consistency but wasn't the one to kind of be on top of me about it. It was more like we had outsourced it a little bit. Like I could talk (laughs) to someone else. And so kind of having that outlet, but her also being a great sounding board for me, um, helped me through those difficult moments. My college coach would check in with us fairly regularly um, while we were high school athletes, but I didn't feel great pressure from him. So I I was committed as a sophomore in high school. So I definitely still had two and a half years before I'd be at Cal, um, but didn't really feel a great pressure from him. I remember just being really excited about the process and a lot of self-motivation to want to be as prepared as possible. And I'm sure as I got closer and knew there was like beep tests and all that fitness stuff, there was, it was a little (laughs) fear driven of needing to make sure I was ready, Um, but didn't, didn't really feel like. I had that pressure as much because I kind of built up those skills and was playing consistently and well. And I think that being committed to a college took a lot of pressure off of me actually, because I Mm -hmm. didn't have to play, but I did. I liked playing in front of all those coaches on the sideline. I thought that was fun. It was kind of like a performance and a way to kind of show off. Mm -hmm. But once that process was over and I knew where I was going, there was less of a pressure to perform. And more of I could just enjoy the game, which was a nice kind of break. So I don't know if there was technically any specific habits that I implemented, but it was more like a relaxing, less overthinking. I'm a chronic overthinker. So that was nice to not do that. Yeah, it's when it feels it sounds like and feels like when you got to the point where you you know where you're going, you're committed. Seems like you were having a good relationship with your coach. That's that's great. Um, There was allowed you to have some freedom and when you Mm -hmm. have freedom within your sport that's where you can experience joy more you'd be a little more joyful instead of being stressed out and overthinking things and um and just bringing on more stress totally because there's there's an athlete right now that you know i won't say what sport and what college he's going to but uh he's actually 
playing for the number one school in their sport in the country. Mm -hmm. He's already committed. And so everything he does now, he feels like it's he's he's under a microscope. And he's afraid that like, what are they going to think if, if, you know, the what ifs, what if this, right. what if that, what if this? So it's all future-based thinking. So, and I know there's a lot of athletes out there that, because you want to get to that level to mm -hmm. commit and know where you're going to go. And if you do it soon, like like you in your sophomore year, you just, there's this there fear-based thinking that comes in. So I just think it's, I'm, thanks for sharing that because there's a lot of athletes, I think, that go through that, that mindset. And I think there's definitely moments where I was doubtful, or maybe it was like hearing other girls that were national team players that were committing in my class and kind of the fear of what that would look like. So there's definitely moments of doubt, but I remember it being an overly overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive experience um, mm. in that process, just because it was very rewarding. Uh, my parents and myself included, I didn't ever think I was going to play collegiate soccer. Like at a young age, we women's soccer I, I went to Stanford and Santa Clara games and I wanted to be like them but it wasn't an expectation that anyone had so it was kind of a gift and like a really cool opportunity to get to go to a school that is very difficult to get into academically and so being able to have those opportunities with um, my three choices were Cal, Stanford and Santa Clara like in my backyard but amazing wow. academic institutions and just the opportunity to get to go there and they would pay me to go there was amazing. What motivated you? What was that the the center of your motivation? And did that motivation change as you went from high school to college to professional? I think just a joy. I, I, I'm very competitive with myself more than I am with anyone else. And just trying to be the best at my craft was what kind of motivated me to be a great soccer player. Um, in terms of wanting to play collegially, once like opportunities started coming in, I was like, okay, let me, I can push myself and continue to be the best I can on the field to see what those schools are. And maybe I can go somewhere that I'd never dreamed of. And so I don't know if there was one specific thing, but it's always been very internal, always being critical and competitive with myself to a fault at times. And I think that that can right. waver definitely onto an unhealthy side, but it was very much um, self-driven and just kind of wanting to always improve, always learning and always getting better. Beautiful, beautiful. And because I'm in this work, in this line of work, um, you said that you worked with a sports psychologist mm -hmm. in high school. How was that experience? And um, would you endorse younger athletes, youth, high school, to actually to connect with mental performance coach, sports psychologist? Um, Considering the, the era that we're living in, there's a lot of mental health issues, a lot of different kind of stresses right now versus when we played. Um, what was your experience like? It was very positive. Um, I worked with a woman who worked mostly with soccer players. So it was kind of catered toward um, the specific things that I was dealing with. She was a soccer player, so she could relate to it, which is great. And I think it encouraged me to be reflective and work on that self-awareness piece. And I know we'll talk about female footballers, but that's what we focus on really. And I think it's had a massive impact, not only for me as an athlete, but even just me operating in daily life and kind of understanding how my thoughts and emotions impact the things that I do. So the opportunity to reflect, to visualize, to kind of use these tools to improve as a soccer player and get out of my own head in the way that kind of stops me from progressing and using it in a way that could um, expand what I was doing and better understand why I was thinking the way I was, um, was a helpful skill. And I think learning it at a younger age was definitely beneficial. And out of all the skills that you learned through that process, because uh, I know as a mental performance coach, there's all these different skills that I teach and there are few that I love teaching. But then as an athlete, I know that there was some that I gravitated to as an athlete that I loved. So out of all the things that you were exposed to and that you implemented, what was the skill or skills that you really enjoyed practicing? One is visualization um, because it provided that confidence when I didn't have it. It's something I have used at every point in my career as an right. athlete. So visualizing myself doing the things I do really well before I step on the field would take away that that fear that nervousness and knowing that I was able and capable of those things because I'm seeing myself do it 
um, was very stress relieving. And it could be at any point, it could be related off the field to related to schoolwork or something else. But yeah. that was something that really um, helped breathing. I know everyone kind of complains about breathing and it being boring, but it really, it's amazing like how these physiological things we yeah. can do um, definitely help. And then just writing and journaling. I've always been someone Um, not as much in my professional career, because I think I didn't need it as much. I kind of graduated from those skills. Once I had it kind of, I could do it in my head. Yeah. Um, but I would reflect after games, after ODP in middle school and high school, um, and games and be like, okay, what did I do? Well, what did I not do well? And like Mm. kind of understanding and analyzing my game from my own perspective, um, those things became, kind of staples. And then by the time I was older, I didn't really need to write it down anymore. I could just kind of think about it more deeply. Yeah. yeah. Just becomes a best practice and it's what you do. So it's not right. an event or an exercise after you just do it. Exactly. Um, and that's repetition. That's reps. I love it. I love it. Now, so you have all the tools, you have all the experience, you have all these years under, you know, behind you now um, playing soccer. How would you describe your mindset? And did it change? If you're going to describe it, how did it change over time? Um, I think as I got older, I thought of it less as like, this is the end of the world if I don't do well. And like, this is the only thing. And at least for me going, playing at Cal, um, I chose, the reason I chose Cal was that I wanted to be somewhere where if I got hurt, where would I want to be and enjoy and like the experience. So it wasn't a purely soccer motivated decision. And I think mm-hmm. that's kind of how my mindset shifted as I got older. And even to playing professional was I had a lot of different interests and always being like, okay, I want to get the most out of every experience and whatever soccer one that is from a mindset perspective, it's okay, I'm going to do a hundred. I'm obviously going to give a hundred percent and be the best I can be, but it was um, wanting to be the best I could be in multiple things and kind of be a Renaissance person in that regard. So I took a lot of pressure off myself because I will talk about identity and stuff, but like people tie their identity solely to being a soccer player. And now that I've kind of transitioned out of sport, um, I've never kind of felt that way. And it's been an okay transition because I've had a lot of things. So I think my mindset as I got older was like, I'm interested in a lot of cool stuff. Soccer is one of them. It's something I do and I really enjoy it. And I want to be the best I can be at it. Um, But I'm not putting all this pressure on myself anymore. When I was younger, I think I definitely did that. And that impacted my performance. And there are points, of course, in college and professional work, you still are like anxious and making those decisions that aren't always helpful for you. But it was really about, okay, enjoy this. And in professional, enjoy this. Because like, this is an opportunity a lot of people don't get. So I guess more like mindset of gratitude rather than like, this is the most important thing in the world. I, I love it so much you brought that up because identity, you see this in all levels and all sports. Um, a lot of athletes get so tied into their identity as, as an athlete. And sports is just what you do. It's not who you are. Right. And where I'm at as a mental performance coach, it is so neat, especially when an athlete is so caught up in their identity and they don't even know who they are outside of the sport. It's, it's neat for me to get them to see the other thing. So it's like, you know, when you, there's like this analogy of when you look, look into a lake, what do you see? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people that are so focused on their identity as an athlete, they, they see the reflection. Right. It's, it's more me. That's it. They don't see the full lake. They don't see the things outside of it. And to get an athlete to, to see the full picture and experience it and feel it and hear it and all the other senses uh, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Cause I've been there and I right. had to work myself out of it. So to teach people to do that, it's, it's kind of a magical experience. Definitely. And I think that the earlier you can teach that the better. And for me, at least having those other interests was also an escape from soccer when it did become mentally overwhelming and things were happening. It was both things could be beneficial, mutually beneficial. Schoolwork was a nice thing. Not everyone loves schoolwork. I'm kind of a nerd. <laughs> I love schoolwork. You're like, that's not an outside thing. Um, but like, for example, like schoolwork and like volunteer stuff, um, those were releases from at least collegiate soccer when it's like all 100%, like there's a lot of pressure on the line. 
those other things were nice to have those extracurriculars. Um, and then soccer was a nice break from those. So kind of being able to find things you're passionate about outside of soccer, um, made it easier to kind of compartmentalize my brain. Also, when I would go to soccer, I was there when I wasn't, I wasn't in soccer. That's, that's huge. It's, it's, I call it switching on, switching off when to switch mm -hmm. on and switch off because you can't, you can't always be the soccer player at all times, right. you know, that's, and a lot of things will come up, especially burnout. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that we talked about that. Now, I love this question because I know, especially with someone like you that played so many years at a high level, um, what was your most proudest moment throughout your career? Hmm. That's hard. I think the first one that comes to mind um, was getting to play UEFA Women's Champions League um, against Atletico Madrid. And we were a smaller team. It was when I was playing in Serbia. So we weren't expected to do well against this big club. Um, but it was my proudest moment, I think, because I, first of all, I was marking um, a forward on the Brazilian women's national team and like kind of wow. kicking her butt. So I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> like it was just a very gratifying moment to sh like, it kind of pushed away those like worries of lack of confidence and like showed like, okay, you deserve to be here and you've worked very hard for it. So I guess it's kind of a culmination of like all the hard work I'd put in, all the hours, um, physically, mentally, all that, um, and really getting to enjoy a cool moment and just be play against players that you watched on TV growing up and what a cool opportunity it was. Man, and Atletico is no joke. Like they're no, they're great. They're great. Um, what about the most challenging moment you had to deal with, and how did you overcome it? I would say my sophomore year of college was difficult. Um, at the end of my freshman year, I randomly fainted on the field. And it was kind of a weird thing where I was then out for six weeks and I couldn't finish the remainder of my spring. And this had been after I was a starter my freshman year. So I came in, um, did a great job for the team um, and felt that I kind of established myself as a player on the team. And then this kind of event happened um, and then I came in my sophomore year and my coach didn't feel that I had developed in that springtime when freshmen do. And so I lost my starting spot for a be most of the beginning of the season. And that was a really hard transition, especially I think I was very fortunate to come in as a freshman and have an opportunity to start because that doesn't happen for a lot of freshmen and right. most college players, they're the starters. Every person that comes into a college program is the best player on their team. And then you're with all the best players. And I think yeah. that transition is the hardest part of college soccer or college sports in general. Um, but kind of having that lull a little bit later in my sophomore season and it um, being like a year of really, needing to have a good relationship and understand my coach better and have us have a good working relationship, which I thought we had, but it just wasn't as strong as maybe I had thought it was. And so kind of dealing with those pains and really having to be an adult and go into meetings in those rooms and have um, important conversations about my growth as a player and have kind of those adult conversations that at 18, 19 is not yeah. something that you're used to having. I would say that was the most challenging. So it wasn't necessarily like a game or a moment, but it was a process of kind of establishing myself again and then finishing up the year strong and then junior and senior year having a very successful career that ultimately led to playing professionally. But it was just kind of those up and down moments and having to um, bring about that consistency again. And in the coach's eyes, he's the one who makes the decision. So doing taking the steps and, putting systems in place to make sure that undeniably I was the choice to put on the field, which your coach and yourself obviously don't always agree with what that looks like. So finding right. out how to do that. And sometimes you're doing things you don't want to do, but of course that's kind of what it takes at that level. You know, I love it that you brought up having communication with coach because it's really important. Um, and when you're younger, in your career, sometimes it's depending on the coach and that dynamic. Right. It'd be really scary. It could be tough because um, you don't want to expose too much about how you feel, what you're thinking, because you you don't know what coach is going to think. But right. um, I, I I mentor a lot of 
athletes in this area on leadership. And a lot of times I get back, like they ask me the question of like, I know I need to talk to coach, but what do I say? How do I, how do I get this conversation going? So, and you know, obviously I have some thoughts on this, but what, what were some of those conversations like? What did, how did you start them? What were some of the, the topics that you were addressing? So at least from a soccer perspective of when I wasn't starting games, I personally always come at it from a point of, okay, what do I need to do to grow? Because if you go into a conversation saying like, why am I not starting? That's yeah. not a, a productive conversation. <laughs> in the coach, and most coaches are going to get defensive right away and come up with reasons and like bring up all these things that maybe they hadn't even thought of in the first place. So saying, hey, like I really want to be a contributor to this team, which I think any position, if you're sitting on the bench, if you're coming off the bench, if you're starting are all important roles to play on a team. Um, but I was like, I want to be a contributor on this field. Um, what are the things I need to do to get there? And the coach will tell you what those things are. And opposed to kind of having that, why am I not starting conversation instead of, cause you're not doing this, it's like you could be doing this, this way. And so kind of getting clearer instructions. And for me, my coach was very open to doing private, um, or individual or small group sessions with us before mm -hmm. training. So for me, did I want to wake up before our 9 a.m. training and be out there 45 minutes early? Not particularly, but it was putting in that extra work. I'm like, hey, or can we do 8.15 on Tuesday once a week or something like that? And just being on top of him and texting him. Most coaches are more than happy to help you get better yes. because it only makes their program better. And if they show, if you show that investment, you're more than likely going to be um, see that return eventually. And so it was kind of sitting in on such like, Hey, can I watch my last game with you? Can we watch it together? And it's hard. It's hard to sit and watch your mistakes <laughs> with your coach sitting there, Right. but you get so much better because you understand how he thinks. Yes. And I think understanding the brain soccer specifically is very subjective. There's no times or anything that can determine whether or not you're playing well, other than let's say pass connection or something like that. Right. Right. Um, but if you can have a better understanding of what that per your boss or whoever it is wants to see out of you, then you can have a better relationship. That was a long winded way of saying, um, oh, I love it. Focusing on kind of the, the learning and the growth mindset, like how you can keep getting better and taking criticism and constructive feedback is very difficult, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. And then you just keep asking and asking, and then kind of nothing can tear you down at some point if you ask enough. Right. No, I, I man, music to my ears. I love it. Mm -hmm. I also tell athletes too, as far as building that relationship and that comfortability with your coach um, and having a solid level of communication, um, yes, Talk about how you can get better and have that dialogue, but also have conversations with your coach about the sport. It doesn't have to be necessarily about you or the team, right. but as you're scouting other teams, talking, let him or her know what you're seeing, ask questions about the scheme. Or if there's a professional game or there's some kind of monumental sport, you know, event, <clears throat> look at leadership, talk about culture, talk about you buy language and have those discussions with coach because any coach out there will love to talk about that stuff. Right. You know, sure though, they want to talk about development. They want to get you better, but just getting that comfortability to talk about the game, mm -hmm. let the coach understand your IQ and your EQ. Right. Definitely agreed. It's huge. It's huge. Um, so you played all these years. This is really important on my show because I know it doesn't matter if you're professional or not. When you have put in a lot of time into a sport that you love, you, there's gonna, there's going to be an expiration date. You're gonna you're actually gonna, you have to transition. And I've seen a lot of athletes um, have really tough transitions, and I've seen really incredible transitions where people um, some of it's timing, some of it's was great planning. So since you you're freshly retired from professional soccer how has your transition been and did you did you plan for it do you feel like that you transitioned out gracefully yeah i definitely planned for it i think 
it was always cool that I got to play professional soccer and it kind of became a more real opportunity as my Cal career progressed, but I didn't ever intend for that to kind of be the goal. My goal since I was kind of early high school is I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Um, And so I've kind of always set that academic piece, those internships and the networking side that has always been something that's been very important to me. And I was part of an organization called SAC at Cal, which is Student Athlete Advisory Committee. It's essentially student council for um, athletic departments. Mm. And a big part of what we do there is career development and leadership and networking and all that kind of stuff. So making sure those opportunities were available to collegiate athletes um, as well as the ones who went pro um, was important to me. So it's always been something that I've been very aware of and kind of was excited about those next steps. And something I'm equally passionate about was kind of that professional opportunity, not as a soccer player. So at least for me, I didn't know exactly when I was going to stop playing, but I knew that right when I was done playing, I was going to apply to law school and go to law school. So that's what's happening this fall. Um, And it just happened that it was four years until kind of that process had started. Um, But it it was the right time for me. I think at least playing professionally in Europe, we, and we're seeing some issues in the NWSL as well. There's a long way that um, women's sports needs to develop on the professionalism side. And I think people think it's a very glamorous life. It's compared to men, it's not. And so it definitely um, ages you a little bit in terms of, okay, I, I am enjoying the sport, but I don't think it's um, as sustainable um, for a lot of girls in terms of, I was ready to kind of move on, not just because it was challenging and like it wasn't as um, rewarding anymore, but um, I was kind of ready for a next step. But it was definitely that, not that I was happy to leave on my own terms, which was nice. And like, I felt I was playing well. And I wasn't kind of on a downward trajectory on the way out by any means, which unfortunately I think happens to a lot of athletes. They're kind of pushed out of the sport or injury pushes them out of the sport, which I was lucky to not have those issues. But it was kind of like, because I plan to work in sports um, law is kind of my goal and hopefully some advocacy on that end of student or student athlete and professional athlete, like welfare and making sure that they have kind of those important Um, accommodations and employment contracts but it playing abroad definitely gave me that perspective was like okay there's some room to grow and made me excited about that next step in my career off the field wow and I and I know you're still connected to to the sport but I know it's somewhat fresh that you've Mm -hmm. retired but um are you are you missing it you missing the the routine of training and just just competing I, yes, I think more missing the routine. I'm someone who likes to have a very regimented schedule. And before I'm, before I've started school right now, I've, I'm still working, but I've kind of got this more flexibility than I like. I've always been someone who needs to kind of plan their free time and load myself up with so many things so that I don't kind of have those uh, time periods to kind of not really have something to do. I'm not, I'm not a very good idle person. I need to constantly be moving. <laughs> um, so I think that's the routine that I miss the most. Um, and having kind of that structured exercise time, I'm realizing that I cannot eat whatever I want or like as much mm. quantities as when I was an athlete, because I'm not exercising <laughs> as much. So right. just trying to find times to, um, to keep that kind of routine going, which I'm trying to do with like exercising and setting up my day. But I think that's been a weirder transition than actually missing the sport itself. I've still been kind of training and playing like more casually. So I'm around the game, but yeah, I do kind of miss, I guess, that high level of it and competing and being challenged in that way. Got it. Absolutely. So now you're, you transitioned out you know, you're getting ready to go to law school. Now you're involved with this incredible uh, nonprofit, female football players or footballers, mm-hmm. sorry. Yes. Um, tell me about the organization. Um, tell me a little bit about it and why you teamed up with them. Yeah, totally. So we are a, a newly established nonprofit. We've been around probably full steam for about two years, um, but finally getting things into place and growing. Um, And we are an organization that is right now all women, um, women women-driven, 
um, also founded by a Cal alum, so go Bears. Um, and we work on the mental side of the game through curriculum, research-based um, curriculum and mentorship programming. So we work with individuals with mentorship programs. So we pair um, a girl up with a professional or collegiate player, and they get to work through our curriculum on kind of the issues related to mental skills of motivation, confidence, self-awareness, body image. And that those topics can kind of be catered to what that girl is looking for kind of to work on. Um, yeah. But the real value in that program is kind of getting to work one-on-one -on -one with a girl who's, who's been where you want to go. And it's so like our big motto is like, you can't be what you can't see. And so being able yeah. to work with women who've been at the highest levels of the game and learn from them as leaders, whether or not they're still playing or not, and kind of seeing the possibilities, something that's important to us. And then we also work with teams like clubs, um, parents and coaches on these skills also, and just kind of raising the awareness of how important the mental side of the game is. And that it, like we said, it is, it's a habit and it's something that needs reps, just like the technical side yeah. and trying to get that message across to coaches and parents is a struggle sometimes. Right. Um, but we definitely see that um, girls deal specifically with some of these mental issues a little bit differently than male athletes do. Um, and so that's why we're catered toward them. And I got involved in this organization because like these were some of the issues that I struggled with as a young person and wanting to have some type of community like this at a young age would have been really beneficial. Yeah. I, I, I applaud you and the rest of the staff there that are that's running this program because I know when I was playing, uh, I needed someone like me. And right. and it was so interesting that when I was playing, especially in high school, my motivation changed from high school to college. But in high school, my motivation was all external. It was all it was all about do people are people gonna like me? And if I have a bad game, are people not gonna like me anymore? It's not about if they think I'm a good football player personally. Are they gonna like my my stock was so tied into uh, my performance and I had nobody to talk to. I probably did. I just didn't know that there were like, it was okay to, okay to talk. So the fact that you have this out there is, um, is incredible. And how can people learn more about the organization? So we're on pretty much all social media. We're even on TikTok because we got to hit those young kids. Yes. Um, which were femme footballers um, on everything. And then you can check us out on our website at femalefootballers.com. But we've got plenty of resources for, we primarily work with girls like 10 to 18 on this sort of stuff. Um, 10 is kind of when they can start to grasp some of these concepts a little okay. bit more easily. It's harder at the younger ages. Um, and then we also do programming for college teams and for college girls. I mentioned I was in that SAC organization. We've created kind of a SAC for women's soccer. So we have monthly meetings where girls can come and talk about this sort of stuff. And particularly like re in the recent months when we've had so many um, tragic deaths um, related to mental uh, health issues in college mm -hmm. sports, we want to provide that um, space where girls can come and talk. Um, or just have, we provide resources, that kind of stuff. Also related to professional development. So showing them that there is a life beyond soccer um, after they're done. Cause I, I don't know your experience with this, but it seems like the transition out of collegiate athletics seems to be more stressful for a lot of kids, just because there's so many more of them um, that yeah. don't go on to play professionally. And maybe they didn't reach the highest level. Like they didn't make it to that next thing and kind of that pinnacle um, but we find a lot of like college girls are kind of like, okay, what's, what's next? Like, I don't really have anything else outside of the sport. And so if we can kind of give them, uh, exposure to some of those opportunities, um, that's really important to me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. I've seen that with college athletes. What I remind athletes in general, but college athletes that are transitioning out of sport and they're getting into the real world. Right. I'm like, you have such an edge, regardless mm -hmm. if you don't know exactly what direction you want to go with your career, but you know how to be disciplined, you know how to deal with adversity, you know how to communicate, like there's so many things and there's some people have that and they're just good with those with those skills, but you're right. trained and that's value. That's, that's why people hire athletes 
It's because right. you know how to deal with all those things. So just reminding them when they're going through that that gray area of like, what do I do now? It, it's like, well, just just so you know, you're prepared for this. You're built for this. Right, exactly. So, well, one more question, which I love, and it's all about reflection. Um, I think that's where we get our wisdom is when we take time to step back and, and look at the events or the experience. And again, like you said earlier, what went well, what I need to address, what were the lessons? When you think about your whole career, your whole life, what do you think you learned the most about yourself? Hmm. That's a big question. Hmm. Um, I think that this kind of sounds cliche, I guess, but that I, something I've learned about myself and that I want to kind of change a little bit to move forward, like always get better at is, um, I think I've been very successful because I am so motivated to push myself, but I think I'm incredibly future oriented. I know we talked about that a little bit and I think there was a tendency for me to not live in the moment as much as I could have and not enjoy maybe the moment because I was always looking at what's the next thing, what's the next thing I can achieve and kind of planning it all out. And my plans have changed at points. Like there were things that I thought were going to happen that didn't and feeling a little upset when those things didn't happen because I was so set on that future looking a certain way. And I think that if I could have um, enjoyed the moment a little bit more and focused on now, um, it leads for a much happier existence. It kind of tie into that overthinking thing. So I think that's something I've definitely learned about myself and kind of take away is like, a little not it's not regret because I've enjoyed it but it's just kind of like how can I continue to maximize my happiness and all I can get out of life and kind of tweaking that moving forward which is always a a constant um need to remind myself because it's difficult right no it's it's huge uh and I know in it's very similar when I say this but I always say in sports the two most important words is now and next what am I doing right now in this very moment to get prepared for the next thing? And that means now means not only like being aware, but just being in the moment, like to be right. fully grounded right now where your feet are. So um, thank you for sharing that. And I know of course. you told people to, um, you directed them to see, to go to mm -hmm. the female footballers. But if people wanted to connect with you um, and reach out to you, how do they do that? Um, you can find me on Instagram or LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure my name will be spelled uh, the way it is in the show notes or whatever. <laughs> Lucas with a K. I've got every, every name in my name can be misspelled. So that's always, that's my parents' <laughs> fault. Um, but yeah, so happy to connect on either of those. I'm active on both. Um, yeah, just at Haley Lucas, you can find me on both of them. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be a resource to kind of any athlete, non-athlete. Um, I've always found immense value in the mentors that I've worked with um, in any capacity and just being able to ask questions. I think that's, I'm always like, oh, like, what should I do to like be able to do this? It's like, talk to someone you want to be like, ask them what they did, find a roadmap. You're not going to have the same roadmap, but maybe you won't take a misstep that kind of slows yeah. you down from that path and just gathering as much information and advice you can from someone. So if I can be a resource to anyone, I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Well, I, I encourage all my listeners to do that. Reach out to Haley, reach out to her organization. Um, we, we all, I don't care who you are. We all need other people. Uh, we can't keep sure. everything that everybody has stuff. And so the more resources we can go do the better. So Haley, thank you so much for sharing your, your journey, your mindset, your energy, um, and female footballers. Um, I really appreciate you being on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me.